Let's, um, let's move back to uh, what I was intending to cover in the lecture part of today's class, and that's resuming inflow control. So let's recap the example we were looking at on Wednesday, and recall that what we were considering was this tank system, and the key variable we were trying to control on outlet was the temperature T2. And I've drawn this block diagram up here. This, this is in your notes from where we left it last time, so you will have that on the previous page. So our control variable is T2, and where we ended off is we showed where the feed forward controller sits in all of the regular feedback diagrams. So the regular feedback diagram has T2 here, the control variable, my process GP, my controller GC, and the set point of comparison at the front. When we say we design the feed forward controller, right? That, like the question that's in the assignment, how do you design and specify the feed forward controller? That's aiming to find this transfer function over here. That's all the work you have to do to find the feed forward controller. And recall we said at the, at the derivation last time, that transfer function for GFF, the feed forward controller, is minus G D of S on the G P of S. So if you know the disturbance transfer function and you know the process transfer function, you take the ratio of them, the negative sign, and that takes care of cancelling out that disturbance for you. Okay, so with that disturbance there, you should not require feedback control. If the feedback controller matches the disturbance model GD and matches the process model GP, if you know those exactly, you'll get perfect cancellation out here in T2. So that we recall that from Wednesday's class was our goal, to get a zero or a flat line signal at that point. So in fact, you don't need feedback control if you're doing perfect feedback. But why do you have feedback control? For faster disturbance. Oh, why do we have a feedback of portion of the link? Yeah. <coughs> right, so put exactly right. This signal over here coming into the CV might be a, a first order response up. This signal coming from the process might be a, a step down. We're relying on perfect cancellation. When will we get imperfect cancellation? says all the time. That's true. Why is it true? If the disturbance is not a pure step, is that all there is to it? Is it a bit more? Yeah. We'll be able to perfectly um, approximate GP. We never know GP and GD perfectly. We always have some error in our knowledge of the process and our knowledge of the disturbance. We never know those exactly. And so we will never get exact cancellation. And that's why we require feedback control. One of the reasons. What's another reason why we require feedback control? Yeah. We definitely need it if we want to make a set point change. So if the operator wants to make a step change down in the temperature, the only way that that information gets, gets um, through the system is through the feedback loop. Is there a third reason why we need feedback? If we had other disturbances. So here we've, we've counteracted the T1 disturbance, but what if, for example, the feed flow rate is over there, F1? goes higher. What's going to be the effect on T2 if F1 increases? F1 goes up, we've got fast, more flow coming into the system. What is our expectation on T2? Drop. Down, up, down. T2 will drop. The material spends less time in the reactor, less time to contact those coils, less heat transfer, T2 will drop. And so we need our feedback control to bring that back in. Okay, so feedback control is still required for those, for those reasons that we just covered it. Okay, so one 
final uh, point to notice is let's take a look back at what we've gained and what we've lost on the feedback and feed forward movements. Relative to simple feedback on its own, so without feed forward, that's my base case. Now I go add feed forward on. So consider those two scenarios. Does feedback with feed forward get you any improvement when you have disturbances in the feed in their temperature? system has drawn down. So, the inlet temperature, T1 is changing. The inlet temperature. Yeah. Does feed forward help in this case? Yeah. So, what are we going to do? Decide the Still texting, trying to make the website work. <laughs> feed forward control on T1. Absolutely, that's why we designed that feed forward controller. So any disturbances in the feed inlet temperature will lead to an improvement. What about disturbances in the heating pressure? So the steam that we use to heat the tank, that pressure fluctuates. Will feed forward help us? So, feed forward control has no advantage for disturbance coming in here on the, on the heating screen. What about the disturbance in the feed flow rate, the one I mentioned just prior? Feed forward also doesn't buy you anything. Yeah. What about a change for the set, set point in TC? In TC2. No advantage to feed forward there either. Why is that? You want to make a set point change in T2? Is a feed forward controller going to get you any? Right. So look at the look at the flow of information if you make a set point change. You make a set point change down in T2. Set point. There's going to be a change here in the error. The change in the controller output that gets input into the system. You'll see it here in T2 and it feeds back around. At no point does that impact the feed forward block. So the feed forward block could be there, it could not be there. It's not going to help you make a set point change any faster or any slower. Okay, so those are those are those important points on that topic. Now, here's a here's a checklist that you can use, very similar to the cascade control checklist we had earlier. In fact, the first three items are identical. We use feed forward when we've got unacceptable performance and when we have a measurement available. That measured variable that we, that we take on the process must indicate the disturbance. This one's a little bit of a redundancy. Obviously, you need to measure the disturbance you want to take feed forward action on. If you can't measure your disturbance, you can't take feed forward action. But here's the key difference in point number four. There must not be a causal relationship from the valve to the measured disturbance. What does that mean? Here's my valve over here. There will not be a causal relationship between the valve and my disturbance. Here's my disturbance T1. What will happen if there were a causal relationship? sense if there's a for feed forward, right? Because your, your temperature over here, you're feeding forward to counteract that disturbance. And it's going to lead to an additional change in the valve. If the valve affects this temperature, you're going to set up a loop here that you don't want. You want this directionality to be through measuring T1 through this transfer function and then it changes the valve. You don't want the valve to then affect the disturbance. Okay? So very clear direction on what the cause and effect is here in that feed forward control. Okay, so here's a final table that you can use to compare the two systems, feed forward and feed back. Feed forward, obviously, the main advantage is exactly what we intended it for to counteract the disturbance before it even um, affects the CV. 
But another key advantage that you may not realize is that the C4 controller will never affect the stability of the system. Okay, I'm going to um, show you that in a minute. The next important thing, obviously, feedback provides you with zero steady state offsets or offsets free control, and it can work for all disturbances. That points out the, the, the disadvantage of feed forward. Feed forward can only eliminate the particular disturbance for which it was designed. Okay. So each disturbance that you want to counteract with feed forward controller, you're going to need a sensor for that disturbance and a feed forward controller. Two things you need, the sensor and the feed forward controller. And if you want to have a feed forward on a different disturbance, say the flow, F1, you need a flow sensor and the flow feed forward controller for that disturbance. So every disturbance needs its own sensor and its own model. Okay, feedback is very general. Feedback doesn't, doesn't really care what the disturbances are. As long as it sees some disturbance coming into the process, it will take action. But the, the disadvantage of feedback is feedback will only take action when it sees that error. So feedback has to wait until this error over here is non-zero. Feed forward will take action to mitigate that ahead of time. So it's kind of like a predictive um, way of operation. We, we use feed forward in our lives all the time. So those examples I gave last class of if you're driving down the road, you will take pre preemptive action to avoid hitting pedestrians. Or if you're on a bicycle, you move out of the way ahead of time to avoid obstacles. That's a feed forward type of action. Okay. Feedback, you have to wait until the problem occurs before you take action. So that's, that's the key distinction. Okay, so let me go back to the guys at the back. How do you think you're ready? Yeah, the server's not coming back up. So. Okay, do you I want to give us another go? No, the server is like uh, completely, oh, completely down. Completely down. Well, can you, like, is it possible to like, put a part of server or something? Or does so that actually have to do it? A physically different building. Yeah. Like it's yeah. a JG. Yeah. yeah, I think we have to. So we'll have to follow that one. Okay, so we'll follow all for today. But you guys still learned something. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. Thank you so much, guys. Yeah, thank you a lot. Very cool. Thanks for the story. We'll be back in the next class. Yeah, we'll be back. <laughs> okay, so while they're uh, hanging out, I have another handout and we've got some more problems for us to work through and looking forward. Let's get this um, concept really well understood. <laughs> As long as you guys can figure out what's going on, take a look at the server models. concentration of my feed R. So whatever that reactant is, I'm measuring the, the concentration of it at the inlet, and that's fluctuating in a step up. That material gets in here, we measure the flow, the temperature, it goes through a heat exchanger where we heat the feed to some temperature, T3, passes through a packed bed, and at the outlet, AC1 measures again <coughs> 
concentration of the reactants are. So we're measuring our raw material concentration, and ideally that's a very low number, so we get complete or near, nearly complete conversion. Does cascade control work here for that disturbance? What were the requirements for cascade control? <coughs> so cascade control, the first requirement is that you get poor performance. Let's assume we have poor performance with A2, this inlet concentration varies. We see an unacceptable deviation above the maximum. So that that's checked off. The next requirement for cascade control, A2 is measured. Okay, that's true, it's measured. What's the next requirement? That that measurement indicates the presence of the disturbance we're considering. Does that work? Yeah. What's the third requirement, the fourth requirement for cascade control? Causal relationship from the disturbance to to the valve. Okay. Is there a causal relationship if I open that valve, does A2 change? No. So cascade control is not effective. There's the key distinction. People get cascade and V4 control mixed up. That's the key criteria, criteria number four that distinguishes. Okay, so cascade control is not suitable. What about feed forward control? Does feed forward control make sense in this situation? Intuitively, what do you, what's your feeling? Yeah. What would you do if you saw A2, that concentration, increase? You were manually running the system. So in other words, you're now the control system. You saw A2 change on your screen right now what would you do? Change the valve. Which way? Composition's going up. What's going to happen if you close the valve? What's going to happen to T2? Nothing's going to happen to T2. What's going to happen to T3? Close the valve. Drops. Lower temperature, what happens in the reactor then? Slower reaction, lower kinetics. What's going to happen to AC1? Okay, so did you make the right decision? AC1 is going to go up, right? So lower kinetics, your purity of, your, of, the, of this reactant, you've got more unreacted materials going to rise. So that was the wrong direction. So open the, opening the valve would have been a better choice. So AC, A2 goes up, open the valve. A2 goes down, close the valve. So that's your preemptive. If you were the V4 controller, you should expect to see that. So let's make a note of that up here. A2 goes up, you should open the valve. Our solution doesn't show that to us. We've done something wrong. Yes. Do you control your other valve? Oh, this valve. No, we can never control our feed valve. This feed valve is in fact already under feed, feedback control. Something else upstream is already manipulated. You don't have that feed. Right? Feed, feed of, there's an important point you'll learn in 4N. The feed of the major streams in a flow sheet are not under control that you can go change. Why is that? Why can you not go manipulate this flow with that? And you affect your upstream process and you affect your downstream process. And at the end of the day, you have to produce whatever you need to produce, 30 tons per hour, 100 tons per hour. So by opening and closing that valve, you're changing your production schedule. That's not allowed. You can change other things, but you can be sure your boss is going to be pretty upset if you don't produce what needs to be produced at the end of the day. Okay, so Flow rates of the major streams through the process are never available to you as a manipulative variable or seldom available. 
let's take a look at some of the other. If we were looking at this disturbance feed composition, so notice that up there very carefully, the disturbance is the feed composition. Let's assume guesses for all of these. We have unacceptable performance. We're trying to consider which variable we're going to use as our feed forward variable. The first row is all yeses, the second row is all yeses. We measure A2, we measure F1, F2, T1, T2, T3. They're all measured. Which of those indicates a disturbance in A2? A2, obviously, so there's one easy guess. What about F1? F2? Nope. What about T1, T2? Will T2 change if A2 changes? Will T3 change? Yes. Yes? No, it's just composition, right? It's just composition, okay. Might be a minor change, right? If the composition changes, sometimes the density and the heat capacities change, but almost certainly you're not going to pick that up. So all those for the others except for A2. No causal relationship from the valve to DM. Now this is, a, this is a tough one to work through. No causal relationship. So answering yes means there's no causal relationship. Answering no means there is a causal relationship. So A2, no causal relationship from the valve to DM. A, DM is a measure disturbance which is referring to A2. Yes or no? Yes, if you change the valve, you do not affect A2. Opening and closing the manipulated valve up here, the heat exchanger does not affect A2. Does it affect F1? It does not affect F1, so it's a yes. Does opening that valve affect F2? Yeah. It affects F2, so there is a causal relationship, so the answer there is no. No, there is no cause. Okay, so T, T1, uh, T2, I should say. Is T2 affected by the valve? No, T3? Yes, there is a cause and effect relationship, so we put an N over there. Okay, so the last line is easy. You don't have to answer the last line. If there's any N's above you, there's no need to, to keep, up, keep going. So right now, which is the only column with yeses in it? Only A2. Anything else is not suitable. Okay? And that's usually the result for feed forward control. It's, it's intuitive. The variable you want to do feed forward control on is the one you need to measure. So you said if there is a causal relationship, you put an N there? You put an N there because there is a causal relationship. Oh, no causal No causal, yeah. Okay. So that's why I said it's a little bit... Okay. It's the opposite from the cascade. Okay. Oh, yeah. So if there's a, a no above any of them, we don't even have to answer the rest of the question. That's right. You need a full column of yeses in order. So the moment you get a no, there's no re reason to keep considering that. Okay, so there's the, there's the net result. Yes. So for example, if for constraint using uh, number four was no, if number four was no for A2, does that mean you pick the wrong um, control? You pick the wrong sensor. Yeah. Yeah. Let's take a look at this. This is the feed forward control <coughs> structure now on A2. Take a minute and design the feed forward controller if you were given the following information. Let's assume. that GD of S, which is A1, okay, this is important to understand, your disturbance transfer function, the output is A1, the input is A2. That makes sense? Yes? The disturbance transfer function has 0.3 e to the minus 40 seconds S over 35s plus 1. 
and GP of S, what's the numerator for GP of S? Numerator and denominator for the input and output. Numerator? Numerator. Like which two signals, which is the input signal, which is the output signal for the process? What's output for GP? Take a look back at this example. Okay, so your output is A1. What's your input? What is always the input for the process transfer function? The manipulated variable. What's the manipulated variable for the process? Valve position. Okay? So V of S or N V of S, whatever you'd like to say that N V. The process transfer function always is got as the input the manipulated variable. That's by definition the input and then the output is whatever we're trying to control. It's always been like that through this course. Okay? Process transfer function has to always be your valve or your manipulated variable. Okay, so let's say if we open that valve up there, we let more steam in, what's going to happen to AC1? If I open the valve, What's going to happen to AC1? In other words, I'm asking what's the gain of this transfer function? Positive or negative? Negative. So minus 0.1 e to the minus 45s over 54s plus 1. So I'll give you two minutes. Go ahead and design the feed forward controller for the system. sign of GFF? Positive. Yeah? We know that it's positive. We remember we said that our feed forward controller has to open the valve if it sees A2 increasing. Close the valve if A2 decreases. Right? So that indicates a positive gain. If you didn't get a positive sign, you've, you've messed up somewhere. So GFF is the ratio of GD over GP, so it's this, the negative GD over GP, that's the formula we use for GFA. So sub n to that formula, what's the final result? Simplified solution? Three. Three? Um, uh, 54s plus one over 35s plus one. Okay. Let's take a look at how TR got that. So put in minus G, so minus 0 0.3 e to the minus 40s divided by 35s plus 1. And then we're dividing that 
by a negative sign for GP. And there's a minus 0 0.1 e to the minus 45s true of the 54s plus 1. Let's do a bit of simplification here. What, let's first get rid of the dead times, or, or simplify the dead times. How does that go? What happened to the dead times? Why do we drop it? Positive, okay? So if you go look at your dead times, you get e to the minus 40s plus 45s, that simplifies to a plus 5s. We cannot predict five seconds into the future, so we simply drop this entire term, okay? We can't have a positive exponent there. The rest of it, though, simplifies quite easily. There's this, uh, the minuses take care of themselves. Minus over there. So my minus and a minus, that gets me a 0.3 divided by 0.1, so I get a 3 on the numerator. I get a 54s plus 1 on the numerator as well, and a 35s plus 1 on the numerator. <coughs> So we did not get a perfect transfer function here. This is an imperfect transfer function because we took this predictive part away. Remember, there was an e to the plus 5s over here. So we're never going to get perfect cancellation here in our signals. Is there something we can do to the process? This is where process control really starts to matter as an engineer. I, I recognize that most of you in the room won't ever go in and tune PI controllers in the rest of your career. But what you will do is you'll use this knowledge to make changes to your process so that you can make processes easier to control. So if you wanted to get better control on T2, in other words, you want to get better perfect cancellation, what can you change to your process to do that? you introduce a greater time delay in the disturbance, or maybe reduce the time delay in your process? Okay. Why is Joseph saying increase the time delay in your disturbance or decrease the time delay in your process? Because then you'll get a negative number for your, uh, for your delay instead of a positive number. Okay. So what we'd like to do is we realize we can't predict the future. Right? You're getting an e to the plus 5s. Is there some way that we can change our process or our disturbance measurements to get that time delay back. Well, one thing you can do is consider the sensor over here, A2. It's measuring the disturbance. If I move it over here, earlier along the pipe, and maybe I move it just far enough that I get it five seconds earlier, what's going to happen to G, D of S? Remember, this numerator here is GD of S. If I move that sensor A2 earlier along in the pipe, remember what GD of S is. This is why we looked at the circuit. GD of S is equal to A1 S over A2 of S. So A1 is my output, A2 is my input. If I move that sensor forward in the pipe, upstream, what's going to happen to that transfer function? Currently it's at 0 0.3 e to the minus 40s. Is the gain going to change? Is the time constant going to change? Is the time delay going to change? Which way? More negative. It's going to become more negative. And if I move it five seconds earlier, that's going to become e to the minus 45s and e to the minus 45 s will cancel. And then writing this with no term over there actually makes it more accurate. Okay. So there's a really <coughs> easy way to make your feed forward controller better, is simply relocate the sensor. Can you do that though? Like, you put a sensor in and measure it, and then can you do that if it's quirky? Yeah, often these sensors can be introduced to different parts of the pipe, depending on how flexible the company is making changes. 
Can you control the sensor to move, like based on what, so that it always cancels? Is that like is that like a process you can control the sensor? Generally like, not. The sensor no? is hardwired in that okay. sort of location. Okay. So that's where the insight comes in from from the speed four design. Also, it makes sense, right? If you can measure your disturbance earlier, you can take better action. I think from an intuitive perspective, that makes. Uh, just if you're running on an elect, uh, on a digital controller, can you ask the controller to just introduce like a false time delay? To just okay. Start? Can you ask the controller to introduce a false time delay? <laughs> yeah. Just just start using old stuff. You know, like it gets it and then it just stores it for a second and then it uses it when it. Yeah. So you're lying to yourself. But let's take a look at what what that's doing. It's an interesting idea. But this disturbance that A2 actually does drop at that location oh, right. yeah, time. Okay. So if you're lying to yourself, you're adding yeah. more time delay if you're working against yourself. Okay. But, uh, yeah, I see where you're going. Okay, so I'm going to leave uh, the feed forward topic pretty much at that point. Uh, we covered all the material I, I really want you to cover. The rest of the slides are um, looking at maybe how to combine feed forward and landscape control. So that's over there. That's not really something we cover. It's just for you to know. Um, let's talk about the midterms. Okay, so midterm, there's obviously most of you have had a chance to look at your grade, and I suspect that most of you are not quite happy with what your grade is. Yeah, fair assumption. Yes. Okay, so let's take a look at it. I want you to take this as a challenge to yourself. Why do we learn? Why do we get feedback? Reject disturbances, and we can get to <laughs> okay. right. So, what is what is what is testing do? Testing is feedback to show us where we have shortcomings. Okay. Testing absolutely is a sensor. What if we learn about time delays? Long time delay. So, if I gave you your return back two months from now, it's no good. Right? A long time delay is not going to help you get to set points. So what I want you to do is treat this as good feedback. Use it to identify where your lack of knowledge is. I recognize that many of you haven't got the grade that you would have hoped for. That's, that's, that's a fact. I know it because the average is low. <clears throat> so I'm definitely going to consider, I'm not saying I am, I'm going to consider making it so that if your final exam when it weights with the 12 and a half percent for the midterm, if that's an overall higher grade, I'll use that. In other words, the midterm will get dropped. But I haven't made that decision just yet. So that's definitely an option that I'm considering. But what I want you to do is recognize that this midterm was, there's a lot of concepts on there. And there was, to my mind, a lot of concepts that were really core concepts that I was surprised actually that people misunderstood. Things around, what is the derivative mode in a PID controller do? There was, there was some misunderstanding about that. Okay? There was some misunderstanding about time constants and the meaning of time constants. So take this, take this midterm now, go look at the solutions. Take a look also at your group midterm. If you're in Friday's group, you're going to get it this afternoon. If you're in Monday's group, you'll get it on Monday. And definitely discuss it with the group that you work with or discuss it with friends in the class. But I want you to come to an understanding of where your knowledge gaps are. If you feel that the grading was not fairly applied, uh, then you may speak to the TAs and myself, obviously. That's, that's a given always. Um, the way it worked for the grading was Xamarin, Murdersier, School in, and myself. Four questions, one, two, three, four. So that's the people to go take it upwards. Uh, so I will have midterms A to L at the front, and Colin at the back will have M to Z. 